Thank you all for joining us for our next critical conversation. So happy to be hosting today. Uh, my name is Anita Johnson. I'm the president of business operations for DC United, and I get to be the guest host for today, which I am thrilled to do. Um, we have great guests with us this evening and so excited to share the stage with everybody here today. Um, first, we have Philip, um, the Howard University's men head soccer coach. Philip. If you yes. There we go. <laughs> um, we have Jennifer King, Washington football assistant coach, and then Coach Rob from DC Scores. So thank you all so much for joining us today. First off, before we dive into everything, I'd love for each of you all to take 30 seconds, enjoy yourselves. Uh, Jennifer, I'll start with you first. Okay, my name is Jennifer King, uh, currently an assistant running backs coach with the Washington football team. Um, it's about my 10th year coaching football. Uh, had a start in college basketball where I coached there for nine years and uh, had a successful career, but ultimately football, football pulled me away. And uh, now I'm fortunate enough to be in the NFL uh, working with the Washington football team. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll toss it over to Philip. I'm going to do a quick 30 seconds. Uh, my name is Philip Jow. I've been coaching um, soccer for over 20 years. Um, head coach of the Howard University men's uh, soccer team. And uh, I'm glad to be on the panel. Thank you. And Coach Rob. Um, good evening, everybody. Charles Robinson. Been in education for, I believe, 44 years. It'll be the 45th at the end of this year. Been at Truesdale Elementary School for the past 28 years. And been engaged with um, DC Scores, our soccer program, for that time. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. And so for today's critical conversation, um, we've lots to talk about. And for those that have watched one of these before, been part of one of them, you know this is kind of a free flowing a dialogue that we like to have when it comes to these conversations. Um, I will ask questions, but please feel free, jump in if I miss anything or something you really wanna share along the way with us. Um, Jennifer, I'm actually gonna start with you uh, with this question. This year we've seen several glass ceilings being broken. Uh, myself being one of them, you being one of them, lots have happened in the sports world from on the field to front office of women continuing to push forward and minorities in the business of sports. And so with that, what do you think this demonstrates um, for the industry? Um, I think it shows that diversity wins. Um, obviously, I had friends with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who just won Super Bowls now and, um, you know, their staff is the most diverse in the NFL. And um, the success that they were able to achieve, I think, is a, a great example to show why uh, diversity is important just for different point of views, different experiences and, and the different backgrounds can lead to something beautiful when all put together. Absolutely. And why do you think it took felt so long for this to happen? Um, you know, people don't like change. <laughs> change is tough sometimes. And, you know, we get into our our rut of hiring practices and it's hard to get outside of of the norm sometimes. But but finally there are some changes taking place and um, I think it's really cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in complete agreement with that. And um, Coach, uh, HBCUs have historically used to compete and even dominate at the highest level in college sports. Um, then a shift occurred. And I think a lot of that shift occurred when sports became the gateway to pro sports, when college sports became the gateway to pro sports. Top tier schools had programs and assets that HBCUs did not have access to necessarily. And HBCUs didn't have the same access to some of these program abilities as some of these major big time colleges. And I think that really had a big effect on what happened to talent levels at HBCUs and the continued expansion of programs. Uh, what are your thoughts in that space? And how do you see now what trends such as what happened at Jackson State and others moving forward to really help bring that extra life back into HBCU sports programs? Well, I just, um, I just think that it's going to just take little by little steps, you know, because in the past, Howard University, we used to get all the players from Nigeria, all the players from Trinidad, all the players from uh, Jamaica, and so on and so forth. They were national team players. And then so it was like easy to win at that time. But since that time, um, all these other schools started recruiting from Nigeria and Ghana and these other places and uh, made it kind of difficult for us to compete because they had the most money, they had the best facilities, and then when players see that, they tend to want to go to those places, right? And um, until we can change some of this stuff that we have, um, maybe locker rooms, soccer fields, and um, facilities like those big schools, 
um, I think we'll be able to compete, but it's going to take um, a little bit of time. Yeah, and I think obviously don donors back to those schools are a big reason why they're able to build those facilities and do those things. Um, how do you feel that we, whether it's from the African American community or others, could really help support HBCUs in a better way? And please feel free, Jennifer, um, Coach, please feel free to jump in on your thoughts on this as well. Okay, well, I mean, um, donors, like you said, um, are very important, but um, I think all it takes now, like especially in a sport like uh, basketball, um, you remember the Fab Five, took five players just to change um, a school, you know? So in, I think in, in sports like basketball and maybe volleyball and things like that, it could happen, but 11 v 11 football, soccer, um, is going to be more difficult because you need more and more players. And, you know, it's got, you've got to be able to convince enough of them to come to these schools, you know. So I think it's just going to take uh, a little bit of time. But all it takes is just one sure. champion, and then the sky's the limit. Yeah. Coach Rob, you're working with these younger students, getting them through DC scores, just starting to play sports. How do we help communicate that message about HBCUs and different options for colleges for some of these young students early on? Well, for, for I can say for Truesdale, I can recall and go back 20 some years. I'm much older than most of you folks that are here. It looks that way. But um, I can recall, I can be, begin, I can reflect upon when we first started that um, we were only into basketball, volleyball, kickball, and football. And uh, at that time, the population was basically black. As the school migrated and changed, we began to see an interest in, in soccer. Soccer at one time was a sport in which we barely had enough folks to compete on the field. Um, because people weren't interested, the school wasn't interested, the community wasn't interested. And um, what we were able to establish was, with DC scores, a sense of commitment, consistency, and an engagement with academics and also a sport. What I found was that there were many individuals who, because they had never been exposed to soccer, um, really had the athletic ability, had the intellect, but just weren't given an opportunity and a chance. So we started with just an elementary. Um, our, the school then moved into a middle school concept. So we're able to keep the elementary through middle school. We've now added the last three years of junior scores program, which incorporates our first and second graders. So what we have en enveloped and developed, it's been a sense of family, community, and school. And you know, as I see it myself, um, the athleticism, the skills that are told in the soccer field can excel through any sport. Yeah. According to the U.S. Soccer Foundation, underserved communities are four and a half times more likely to lack recreational facilities to play organized sports. Without infrastructure, it's extremely challenging. How and what, we, how and what can we do to improve these circumstances for youth sports and for youth in these areas to have access to sports? I, again, I go back when we first started that uh, we better go get the, the field cut, the grass could be cut. So what I would find myself doing to coaching staff is getting the lawnmowers, knocking the field down, and making it to feel like it was a venue in which folks could see on the television. And from year to year, you know, we pressed the fact that we had more individuals waiting to be on the field just to play soccer. We engaged the community, our parent group, um, DCPS, and, and requested and continue to fight for the fact that, look, we need a field. Our children are entitled. They need a field of some sort. And it's taken a long time, but I can say that right now we're under the construction with DC United and the Cal Ripley Foundation that we're going to have a state-of-the-art field. And for me, that's a personal piece in which these families that gather on Thursdays, the middle school teams, which we lost our middle school, but we traveled on buses from week to week, but because of the sense of us being engaged five days a week, two hours a day, with that sense of a foundation, knowing that perhaps as these folks travel to high school and college, as your coaches have stated, 
there's a foundation. There's a need. There's a willingness to compete, whether they're on the field or in the classroom. Awesome. For Jennifer and Coach Phillip, can you talk about what youth sports meant for you all and how it impacted where you are today? Oh, I mean, uh, youth sports was everything for me. Um, I remember um, growing up here in Maryland. Originally, I'm from Ghana. I was born in Ghana, you know, and um, came to the U.S. when I was in the fifth grade. And, um, I mean, soccer has done so much for me. Uh, my father played in the Olympics for Ghana. He represented Ghana. I was lucky enough to represent the USA as a player. Um, my son represented the USA as a player. And, and my daughter also represented. <laughs> uh, so sport is a big part of our lives. My daughter is going to Duke University on a so soccer scholarship because of soccer, you know. And then so um, I'm in a, a position to help so many young players um, get scholarships. And I've, I mean, um, I've been coaching for over 20 years. And I, I can honestly say I have put at least 100 kids into college, you mm -hmm. know. And um, I've gotten kids to play professional, and um, including my son. My son played in Germany. And um, a lot of his friends on his same team when they were younger um, got a chance to also uh, represent USA because of some of the trainings that I was doing with them. So um, soccer and sports in general is, I mean, it's a big time tool for underserved communities to get um, a free education or whatever. It, it all depends on the exposure, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, if they get that exposure early in life and get to compete some of the highest tournaments in the country, I think the sky's the limit. Of course, academic piece of it is important. You have to do well in school in order to go into college and do well. But um, sports has been a big, big part of my life. And you're out at the fields today, aren't you? Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I saw he, this is why he had to sneak away, guys. He can't get away from the fields. He's out at the fields right now. So we appreciate him making some time for us today. Um, Jennifer, for you, you know, how has sports impacted your life from a youth standpoint and your growth? Yeah, you know, like coach, sports have been everything to me. I started playing on a team when I was seven years old. I've essentially been a part of a team ever since. Um, you know, I was in middle school playing on three or four different teams at one time um, in school and outside of school. So uh, I feel like sports has been everything to me. It's taken me places I never would have gone. Um, normally, it's taken me around the world to be able to play sports and compete. And um, I think it's, it's given me more than I could probably ever give back to it. But, um, you know, I, I just love sport. And I think it's so important for kids to get involved. Uh, just statistically, it shows, you know, the benefits of children being involved in sport. And that's why it's so important for to have proper funding and proper facilities for them to learn and grow, uh, not only as athletes, but as people as well. I feel like too, a lot of time in our communities, especially in the African-American community and diverse communities as a whole, like sport is taught to us as our escape. Like, and you can agree, disagree, please feel free. But I feel like it's in many of our communities and diverse communities, it's told to us as being our way out, you know? And that's why people practice so hard and, and do it because they're not sure what other way it, sometimes, you know? Obviously college education plays a big part, but I feel like it, in our communities, it's something that's always talked about is that, you know, that next star, that next athlete. And it's not even about just being the star, but Coach Phillip, as you said, like just getting that scholarship to actually just go have the opportunity to get an education when necessarily your families may not be able to pay for it. And, you know, I, that's one of the things that I see in the space. And what are you guys' thoughts on that? Well, well, for me, it's, it's a sense that um, <laughs> I reflect that, that when I was a kid, sports was an outlet from the family. Um, the values in, that, that were taught within the family, you brought them out to the, asphalt when we were playing baseball, not on grass, but on asphalt. You brought them to the basketball court, as you can see everyone on the basketball court being there, you had to practice just so that you would not be sitting out watching five or six other games. Those days in which we were out there in the heat, those days we grew up in Southeast Washington, right at um, RFK Stadium. And I recall on Sunday mornings, the group of us would get together and play on the grass between the D.C. Army and RFK Stadium as the folks would be moving to the Washington Redskins games. Wow. And um, those memories 
stayed with me for a while, even through the fact when I um, tried to play baseball. I think I was too stocky for baseball, so I went into football. But those first 17 years of, of my own professional piece, I worked in a basketball school, a Catholic high school in D.C. And um, there were a number of folks who went to the professional level. But what I experienced and learned and developed at a young age was the fact that there had to be a commitment to academics and also exposure, that these folks gave a lot of time in practicing and just in, in the film room, just learning. That has transferred to where we are now, that I see that those young folks, again, I was never exposed to soccer. I never thought I'd be engaged in soccer. Um, soccer was a, was a game in which the family would drive past some fields in Northwest Washington. And I was like, what the heck is that? I now see it as, um, as a vehicle for the community of Northwest to be supporting and also to have the families wrap around these kids who have something to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've had our writing and poetry championships. We've had some on-field championships. But the greatest experience for me is to see that these folks know you 15 to 20 years later, that they come back and want to do community service yeah. at the school, that they um, are out there telling their neighbors, hey, we got a game, come and see us play. That's what it's all about for me. I love that. And I think that's that's so key. And you see that now even with our athletes, you know, what Steph Curry's doing, um, many of the even Nike and the NFL of what they've pledged back to girls flag football, like people have got to invest back in order to move things forward. And I think people are understanding that power that they have in themselves even more now. And so, Jennifer, I know recently the NFL and Nike pledged five million to grow girls high school flag football. Um, what do programs like this do for the community? Yeah, I think that was huge. And I was fortunate enough to be a part of, uh, of the program, 11 online program. And essentially what it will do is take flag football um, across the country for girls, um, you know, all ball ages. And ultimately, you know, high school flag football has now become a varsity sport in some Southern states like Florida. Um, and and NAI, NAIA schools now give scholarships for flag football for girls. And it's just another outlet for young female athletes to be able to participate in sport and um, I think it's beautiful what Nike is doing. I, I think that's one thing that it takes now with so many, uh, so much funding being cut from, you know, the, the parks and rec organizations and different organizations like that. It's important for these corporations to step up to the plate and be able to provide financial support to, at the grassroots level uh, to help sports excel. How do you feel like this impacts the game from a long-term perspective? Um, I think it'll be huge. You know, when you look in 10 years and you have you know, a girl, a little girl that's played flag football since she was five years old. What type of flag football player could she be when she's 18 years old? You know, and just the, the lessons that she'll learn playing football will be invaluable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Coach Phillips, Steph Curry made a commitment to fund six years of Howard University's first division, excuse me, first division one golf program. It's a powerful example of an athlete making a positive change um, in this space. How does the group feel about athletes like Steph Curry stepping up and changing the game? Oh, that, I mean, that was so huge, you know, um, especially um, at a school like Howard University, you wouldn't think that, you know, uh, someone is going to donate that kind of money and time uh, for a sport like golf, you know, and um, there's been, there's been so much excitement at Howard University since he's done that. Um, we have a, a new golf coach. Everyone's excited about the program and it's just, it just brings notoriety to the school. You know, this is so important. And, and we're beginning to get um, normal people, even outside of the sport, interested in the school because of what Steph Curry has done, you know, because of the profile that he brings to the school. So I think this is so important. And uh, it was such a great gesture. Yeah. And it makes me think about like what Coach Rob said about like when you were young, Coach Rob, you said you didn't even think necessarily to, to play soccer and how it's in become part of your life now. And I also read something recently, um, Coach Philip, about um, the chess club at Howard and how it's like come back to life more recently. And like, it's, it's really nice to watch and see these young people starting to move things forward that maybe weren't necessarily happening as much anymore. Are you familiar with that? Oh yeah, you know, um, like um, what Steph did was contagious, right? Yeah. He did that 
And we've got guys coming out of the blues, just donating to the school and just so excited about Howard University, including alumni that didn't even donate at the time, right? And are now donating. And then so um, I think this is something special. It was such a huge gesture and uh, we are all thankful. Absolutely. No, I agree. And we've seen pro athletes and sports teams become more vocal when it comes to action oriented in their uh, response to social justice this year and their fight for civil, civil justice. Uh, the WNBA was one of the leaders in the space. That was my former life. Um, <laughs> still a part of me. But what do you um, make of this change in demeanor at, at the very top? And how do you feel like it's impacted not only just sports, but the world um, with what athletes are doing when it comes to social justice? Um, I think it's important to to see these athletes now, you know, um, having the courage to step out and really give their opinions on these things and um, share their time and, and their their means to help with programs to to make our world a better place. I think that's the main thing a lot of athletes were afraid of um, until now, until the WBA kind of led the charge was to really speak up and stand on their own. And um, I think the floodgates have, are now dropped with athletes stepping up and, and giving their opinion on things, which is huge just because so many people look up to them and, and listen to them. And now they're using their platform uh, to hopefully make things better. Coach Rob, with that, did you see a change in some of your young people that you work with um, in reference to what they saw athletes doing during this past year? Well, certainly, we're, we're, you know, we're in a, we've been in a virtual mode since March. And it's really uh, challenging because I'm the kind of person, I just want to be hands-on, touchy-touchy, feely-feely, and have had to really become patient in this virtual experience. But um, I'm also the dean of students at Truesdale. So I'm actually monitoring um, classes a lot with the administration. And what I have noticed within elementary children is the sense of, um, because these professional athletes have spoken about systemic racism, spoken about the fact of um, treat me as a person, not for what I do, but, for, but what I can bring. And to have these children ask questions in the classroom regarding, uh, well, you know, hey, uh, well, well, Mr. Rob, LeBron James is this, but LeBron James also said, and he had on the back of his shirt, something to deal with the fact that what we're doing in the classroom from day to day. So it is, certainly has empowered our young people to be very vocal and to be sincere about the passion of just living. Um, for me as a guy in his 60s, um, you know, I go back to the, 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 the Lou Alcindor days and those days of whatever in which folks played, folks made money and gay, but you didn't hear it. Now you see folks giving back. Um, yesterday afternoon, I, it was either yesterday or maybe Saturday, I was watching two black hockey players. Again, another sport that I'm trying to get into, but I'm like, this is something that I never saw as a child. Okay, I didn't even think it was even possible. And to see folks just step up, step out, and be recognized can only move our young people forward. I love that. I love that. And Coach Phillip, obviously, we know most of the movements that have happened in this country have been led by college age students. Um, you know, I don't know if, you know, there's so much that has happened and a lot of, a lot of it, you know, through civil rights, through present day, our young people in that age group, that 16 to in the mid 20s really are those that really help push things forward. And how do you see that within your athletes and, and the students there at Howard? Oh, I, oh, I see it every day. Um, you know, because of social media, um, everyone has a voice now, right? And it brings so much attention to all this stuff that's going on. And um, in the past, I think maybe um, young, younger guys, younger kids, women, uh, whatever, um, wanted to get involved, but um, didn't know how, you know, you had to get maybe on the television, get an interview or stuff like that. Now you have Twitter, you have Instagram, you have Facebook and things like that. And you can just pretty much um, get a group together and pretty much uh, get your voices heard, you know. And um, Howard University is definitely one of the leaders in terms of uh, um, dealing with social justice. And um, I'm proud to be a part of that school. 
And uh, these young guys are really, really uh, making things happen now. I actually, I remember when I was originally living in DC a few years back and uh, I'm a Delta and I remember going to Howard's campus for the very first time. And I remember just standing there and it was like, I, I, I didn't go to Howard, but like standing there um, as a black woman in that space and for the history of what it represents to us. Um, and for me personally, I just remember just feeling so empowered just being on campus for the first time and just understanding the history of that university and what it has done for our communities. I, it's powerful. And I, for those students that are there, I, I just continue to push us forward because so much greatness has come from that school. Oh yeah, I mean, and you know what, uh, academically too, um, we are getting some of the top students, you know, in the past, um, you know, we were competing with Harvard and Yale and Duke and all these other schools. But a lot of those top black students are now coming to Howard because Howard University has got one of the best business schools in the country, uh, School of Engineering and all of it. So everyone's coming back home and it's amazing to see. And I think about too, for everybody here today as part of this conversation, we all have different levels in which we are implemented in somebody's journey in sports. You know, uh, Coach Rob, you have them at the young age. <laughs> you know, you're getting our, our young ones. Coach Philip, you're getting our um, college age students. And Coach King, you, you got them right when they're in the pros, right? So each of us are gonna meet them in different places along this journey. How do we create more opportunities for people of color to work within the sports industry? Because each of you are part of this industry at all different levels. How do we get more? Hmm. I, um, you know, being vocal and um, getting guys to understand that, you know, we need that diverse um, outlook. Uh, I know uh, my son played in Germany, right? and uh, he was playing professional soccer in Germany and even professional um, teams like uh, Bayern Munich or whatever, or Hoffenheim. I don't know. I know some of you guys don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mentioned Hoffenheim, but you know, they would go out and hire hockey coaches to talk to them, to find out about different angles in dealing with soccer. That brings that diversity and a different outlook to the sport, right? And um, I think we're getting more and more of that. And um, like I said, with social media, that stuff is coming out too. So when a position becomes open, that we're able to hear about it and then able to apply for it. And uh, little by little, I think we're making big progress in that space. Anyone else have anything else to add into that about how we continue to find ways to get more people within our industry? Well, for me, it's the sense that, um... We, we go through a, it's hard to say this at the elementary level, so because we're supposed to be more like a fun, loving, and we are, but we're very selective about those folks that we put in front of the kids, those mentors and those coaches. Uh, we all have to have a sense of, of, of a mission, a sense of being very visible in the community, and also being very vocal as the Howard coach just mentioned. Um, every opportunity that we have within our soccer program, I want our children exposed to the White House, to the Senate office building, to wherever. And any time when folks say, Rob, you got a group, I'm jumping on it. Why? Because I didn't have that experience as a kid. I came out of a, a decent, good family, but um, my interest level only in football because that's all I was exposed to. Yeah. And um, and, and to have that opportunity to say, look, I'm walking with you. I'm leading you and your family, hopefully to some greater opportunities that can advance your family beyond that, beyond the systematic racism. Okay. We can't avoid that. Um, we got to keep pushing. We got to keep working. I need to go further than my parents. My grandparents were 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 farmers and fishermen. And my 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 parents said we're not gonna do that. Moms went into Bowie State College, received their degree, dad went into the US Army, and they kept instilling in us, at least in me, the fact of you need to go further. Yeah. Whatever that may mean. And that's what we propel for our students. You got to be further. 
you got to go further to save your family, to save our culture. Love it. Absolutely. You know, and I kind of want to leave on this. And I think for me, I talk about legacy a lot. Um, and Coach Robbie just kind of went into that as well about leaving that next generation. And, and for me, it's a very important part of what I'm doing. And, you know, I've moved a lot. I've been in different job roles, but I, I feel like I want to continue a legacy of like what's possible. Um, and, and pushing the industry forward and, and giving people an opportunity to think differently um, and how they perceive African Americans in the sports business side, you know, to be an executive in this business, it's, it's different. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to push that forward. And so for each of you, how can we leave this industry a better place for the next generation of people of color? Like, how do we continue? If you had one or two things that you're like, you know, what, I want to leave this in a better place and how, what would that be for you? And I'm happy to share mine too, if it helps. And I think for me, it's creating opportunities within the workplace. I wanna see more leaders. And so if I can lead well, and with the circle of people around me that help me every single day to create more opportunities for others and help share at the top level across this league, different hiring practices and, and things about inclusion and diversity, of bringing people into that front door to have the opportunity to get to that next step, that's a big piece for me within my own personal legacy. And so for you all, what's something that you want to leave behind from a legacy standpoint for that next generation? Well, I mean, for me, I want to do the best that I can. So when some, someone is coming behind me, it'll make it easier for them and um, just help as many people as I can um, to get into the field that I'm in. You know, I'm, I know soccer, um, you've got, uh, in coaching, actually, you have that um, minority. You got, you've got, we've got just a little bit of them, right? And um, so, if I do my best, and um, I'm one of the best coaches around, then maybe they'll say, "Well, hey, Philip has done well, so let's um, give some more um, African Americans, some more Africans, or more uh, people of color a chance to come in this uh, venue." Um, so that's what I'm doing, just being the best that I can. That's all. Love it. Jennifer, coach? Yeah, I think it's so important to, to reach back. Uh, so many people help me get to where I am now, and it's important to me to do the same for others. Um, you know, anytime I can help someone or uh, even if it's just giving them advice about the sporting business, I try to do it because it's so important to, to help people because so many people help me. And, um, you know, I just think it's so important for me to, to really rescind that and do that to people as well. Thank you, Coach Coach Rob? Yeah, in the very beginning, uh, when we first started, especially the soccer, um, we would have our home games because we had one of the larger fields. And the visiting teams came deep. And um, I would often look and say, well, we've got 10. They got 100. And those first few years, I actually observed, absorbed what I saw in terms of field preparation, in terms of, um, the parents um, bringing the Gatorade and things of that nature, of uh, uh, folks feeling safe while they were playing, and said, why not us? And that's the passion that I, I keep within myself. Why not us? Why not me? Why not our kids? I want our kids to have that same experience that um, everyone else has. And for folks who are not willing to say maybe spend that extra 30, 40 minutes, or maybe that extra one or $2 to get some snacks, perhaps they may need to find another venue. But for us right now, soccer is the piece that's maintaining our school, academically, socially, and culturally. That's amazing. Well, thank you. I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure. As I was sitting here, I'm like, I'm amongst all coaches. Usually it's not that way around for me. That's why I was like, as I, so excuse me, as I changed your names, as I went along, I was like, wait, let's give all titles properly. Coach King, Coach Phillip, Coach Rob. So, I mean, I don't get to sit with all the coaches all the time. I'm, I'm usually on the other side of the table. So I appreciate your time today. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation with you all. It's been a pleasure. Um, and thank you so much. Um, if you have any other final thoughts, I think we kind of went through those there, but hopefully um, you enjoyed your time and hopefully we'll one day all get to sit in the same room together um, sometime soon and get to come out and support one another in all of our endeavors. But best of luck to everybody. We appreciate you here at DC United and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. It's given me an opportunity to meet a Washington assistant coach 
and also <laughs> a soccer college coach. So, hey, folks, I'm at the elementary. Watch out and look out. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.